I'm delighted you're here tonight, and I hope you've got your Bible with you and eager to take that as we talk about things, as we announce this morning that have to do with our marriage and our home life. Marriage problems are not uncommon at all in our society, and even among Christians, it is not unusual for there to be marriage problems. The divorce rate reached about 50% plus before it began to decline and slightly fell. And it only improved because people are not getting married as often as they did perhaps years ago. They're continuing to live together. And even among Christians, marriage is not always what it should be. By that we simply mean there are far more divorces, there are second and third marriages, more than there were some 30 or 40 years ago. And so consequently, just the fact that there is problems is not just in the world, it's happening even among Christians. Sometimes those that are staying together doesn't mean there's been success because quite often they may argue, they pull apart, there may be communication that is lacking or very poor, and just because they keep it together does not mean there's pro not problems within marriage. There are many families that seem okay on the surface, and yet beneath the surface it may be surprising when we find out what the marriage and the home life is really like. I'm trying to describe that marriage problems are not uncommon. Often when the marriage problem reaches a breaking point, it's shocking to others. Somebody that we thought they had a great marriage, they seemed like they were, were happy on the outside, we thought they got along, we thought things were going well, and suddenly it reached a breaking point. It's shocking to us. Even to the couple sometimes it's shocking. Someone may say, or the couple may say, we didn't think our problems were that severe. We were having some problems, we never thought it to be this great, and now we've come to the breaking point, and they are even shocked themselves. So tonight, let's talk about signs that your marriage is in trouble. How to salvage your family, the marriage, and the home life. And perhaps it would be great if our marriage were like our cars, it has warning lights that tell us there's a problem developing, it needs immediate attention before it gets worse. And so this sign or this flashing light on the dash of your car is supposed to be telling you, you need to seek some attention before things get worse and it completely shuts down. There are some signs that are flashing before us that may suggest there's some marriage problems that should seek some attention from the Word of God before it ever reaches the point that it becomes great disaster. Let's begin listing some things that indicate our marriages may be in trouble. First of all, when one or both partners are drifting from the Lord. When one or both partners are drifting from the Lord, there's an indication your marriage may be in trouble. Let's go back to the book of Joshua, if you will. Let's go to the book of Joshua, chapter 24, beginning at verse 14. Let's talk about when both are committed before the Lord. What if the husband and the wife together, they both have this attitude that we read about in Joshua chapter 24, where the text says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your father served, which are on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If the husband has the attitude, we're going to serve the Lord, and the wife has the attitude, we're going to serve the Lord, here's some things that will be true. Both will be following the Lord's instruction on the home and the family. When both are committed to the Lord, they're both committed to looking to the Word of God and letting that be their guide for the home and for the family. When both are committed to the Lord, there's going to be the best possible source of strength they have. They both are gaining their spiritual strength from the Lord. They also gain strength from each other as they together are serving the Lord. And furthermore, they have a basis on which to identify and solve their problems. They both look to the Word of God and say, you know what, we're not doing this, or we're not doing that, or we're not following the Lord's instruction, or we're not treating each other the way the Lord would want us to treat each other. And now they have a common bond, they have a common source, a common basis to which to identify and then solve their problems. When one or both are drifting from the Lord spiritually, here's some things that may take place. There may be little time for spiritual things. It may only be one partner that's drifting. Or it may be both of them are, are drifting from the Lord. And when that takes place, there may be little time for the spiritual. 
You are familiar with Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It may be that one of the partners no longer has that, that top interest in spiritual things. It's becoming secondary. More about that in a moment. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, we read where the Bereans search the scriptures daily. It may be that one of the partners is beginning to reach the point they're not studying as they used to study. They're not studying as they should. They're not turning to their Bible. They're not spending time with the Word of God on a daily basis. It may be that when one or both are drifting, they don't pray as they used to. Like Daniel, three times a day in Daniel 6 and in verse 10. Maybe they find themselves going days without offering prayer unto God. Their basis for unity and permanence is weakened. The thing that should keep them together so that they have unity and harmony is that they have a common bond in the Lord. But when that's gone, because one or more is drifting, that basis for unity and that permanence is weakened. The potential for adultery is increased. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 2 and in verse 17. Proverbs 2.17 tells me the basic reason why those who are supposed to be God's people who we thought were serving the Lord, who we thought should be happily married, end up having an affair or having adultery. Proverbs 2.17 gives me two causes that are at the root. Here is what the text says. That here is a woman, the text says, this harlot, who is supposed to be in a relationship with God. The text is going to tell us that. She's supposed to be a married woman, but the text says she forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. There are two things that take place as to why she commits the adultery she commits. The first is that her marriage deteriorates. The marriage is beginning to crumble and fall apart. And at the same time, secondly, her faith gets weaker. She forgets the covenant of her God. This is not a pagan. This is one who's supposed to be in a relationship with God, who has a covenant relationship with God, and she forgets that covenant. What I'm suggesting to you is that when one or both parties are beginning to drift from the Lord, the potential for an affair is greatly increased because that's one of the one, two, one of the two basic causes that lead to this affair or this adultery mentioned in Proverbs chapter 2. So let me ask you this question. Are either of you drifting in your marriage? That is, you're drifting spiritually. Are you reading your Bible as often as you did in the past? Are you finding, you know, I'm just not studying like I used to. Do you pray regularly or are you beginning to see there's times that I'm not praying like I used to pray? I go days without regularly praying. Are spiritual matters a common topic in your, in your family and in your marriage as you sit around the dinner table? Do you ever talk about spiritual things? Or as you drive down the road, do you talk about spiritual? Is that a common topic in your marriage relationship? Do you talk about Bible things? Do you talk about raising your children in harmony with the will of God or influencing your grandchildren about Bible things? Are you beginning to do things that you would not have done earlier? Are you noticing your toleration of some things that you would not have tolerated a few years ago? And are you practicing some things that you would not have practiced a few years ago? Are you beginning to see signs that you're drifting? One of the signs that flashes and begins to say, you know what, you need to stop and give some attention to your marriage. Maybe that one or both parties are beginning to drift from the Lord. Here's a second warning sign. The second sign we want to talk about is a greater interest outside the home than within the home. A greater interest outside the home than within the home. There are things that are right within themselves that often crowd into the family relationship and particularly the marriage relationship. For example, recreation. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, families need recreation. And they need to have that kind of, that fun with the family and with the, with the children and do things that, that have to do with sports. Or maybe social events. It may not involve recreation, but it may be social events they attend. It may be attending things with their children. It may be attending things on a social basis with, with folks at work. It may be the work itself. It may be their hobby. It may be spending time with their friends. None of that's wrong within itself. But let's go to Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower. And I recognize Matthew 13 is not talking about marriage. But I want you to notice in Matthew 13 and in verse 22, the text talked about how that the seed that fell among the thorns in this parable is the one who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. 
Here's the same principle. The cares of the world, not wrong within themselves, if that can crowd in and choke out the Word, it can also crowd in and choke out the marriage relationship. And it may be that the work is beginning to crowd in on the marriage relationship. Or it may be the hobby or it may be the friends. You see, there's a sign when you're beginning to make choices concerning any one of those things or others over your mate. When your mate begins to feel you're choosing work over your mate. When your mate begins to feel like you're choosing recreation over them, or you're choosing friends over them, or social events over them, that may be a flashing sign that says your marriage is beginning to show signs of trouble. Let us consider the fact the Bible teaches the husband and the wife need to make each other a top priority. So let's go in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 28 If husbands love their wives as Christ also loved the church, then that means there's going to be a top priority in that relationship. We won't read all of these verses, but beginning at verse 25, so husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. And whoever loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as the Lord does the church. Now I want you to see the principle that the Lord loved the church, that he gave himself for the church, so a man ought to also love his wife. That means he's going to seek her as the top priority in the relationship. That is, he's going to spend time with her. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, where 1 Peter 3 talks about living a holy life. That's the theme of the book. And if you want to be holy in all of your conduct, in all of your conduct you want to be holy. Look at 1 Peter 3 and in verse 7. Husbands, dwell with them according to understanding. First of all, dwell with them. But also be understanding in that relationship. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. That would suggest that they make each other a top priority. Here's another principle. They should want to be together. Like Proverbs 5, 18, I know Proverbs 5 is talking about primarily the intimate relationship in contrast to seeking the harlot, but the text says he rejoices in the wife of his youth. That's far broader than just that intimate relationship. But furthermore, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. One of the reasons that there is some difficulty in being married during the present distress is because in the marriage relationship, you are, or you should be at least, trying to seek the best for your mate. Look at verse 33. Now remember Paul had said it's better not to be married in the present distress. Why is that, Paul? Well, the one who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. That he's interested in what's best for her. He's trying to protect her. He cares about her. He's sheltering her. And therefore, that may create a problem for him when he's trying to serve the Lord in the midst of this persecution, this trial that they're going through, verse 26, the present distress. Look at verse 34. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. An unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may... um, Be holy both in body and in spirit, but the one who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. They're interested in pleasing one another. That is, they're making this principle we've been talking about, the husband and wife are making each other a top priority. Here's a third sign that may begin to flash, saying here there's a problem developing that suggests your your marriage may be in trouble. And that is when both are telling others their mate is the problem. When both are telling others their mate is the problem in the marriage relationship. Counselors will tell you this. Preachers will tell you this. Elders will tell you this. That quite often when there is a marriage problem, the husband will say, she really is the problem. That's where the problem is. It's her. And so you talk to the wife and she'll say, the whole trouble is with him. Each are pointing to the other. Let us be advised that Proverbs 18 and verse 17 said there's two sides to the story. He that is first to defend his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. That is, listen to the husband and he's going to make and paint it like it's all her fault. And so, okay, I got that. You go and talk to the wife. And when she gets through, it's going to sound like it's all his fault. There's two or three sides to the story is the point of Proverbs 18. Now the reason for that is, quite often in a marriage, the focus is on me. The the husband is focusing on himself, and the wife is focusing on herself. That selfishness creates problems. 
Quite often one is focusing on what I need, what I want. I need time to do things for myself. Those are warning signs, particularly in the midlife years, that maybe a midlife crisis is beginning to develop. I need to do things for myself. Maybe little is being said about being concerned about the mate. Little may be said about concern for the children. Little may be said about concern for obedience to the word of conforming our lives that we may walk in harmony with the gospel of Christ, Philippians 1 and in verse 27. It's because there's a failure to examine self. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 12. These basic principles certainly would apply to the marriage, and I'll raise the question, if not, why not? Here is the golden rule of Matthew 7 and verse 12. Whatever you would that men do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The way you want others to treat you, you treat others the same way. Why would that not apply to the marriage relationship? Examine yourself. How am I treating my mate? Philippians 2, 4 is talking about unity and harmony within a church. And I raise the question, why would that not apply to our marriage relationship? Look not every man upon his own things, but every man also upon the things of others. Don't just think about yourself. How does this affect your husband? How does it affect your wife? How does it affect the children? We have a failure sometimes to examine ourselves. We need to be like the disciples in Matthew 26 when the Lord had said to them that one of you will betray me and each one of them began to raise the question, Lord, is it I? There's a problem in this marriage. We need to be raising the question, could it be me? Could I be contributing to that? Now, she may be at fault or he may be at fault, but could I be contributing equal to that or greater to that than they are? Is it I? Am I the one creating the problem? Here's another warning sign that your marriage may be in trouble. And this sign begins to flash. Maybe we need to stop and begin to do some examining. Am I having some problems developing within the marriage relationship? And that's when we ignore the problems. When we ignore the problems we have in the marriage relationship. Often couples approach their problems by just not dealing with them at all. They know the relationship is in a strain. They know things are not going well. They know the marriage is not what it should be, but they just ignore it. And deep down, they will admit, you know, we we are having some problems. We haven't told anyone. We're having some deep problems in this marriage relationship. And I know there's a strain. We're not getting along real well, but we've just ignored that. We've just kind of pushed it to the side. Maybe if we ignore it, it goes away. Maybe they're denying their mate or being denied of the conjugal rights of 1 Corinthians 7, and they think that's normal. Everybody does that. Maybe they know their mate could be involved with someone else having an affair, but they deny it. I don't want to even think that that's possible. And so they're ignoring the problem. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, that problem will go away. I want to suggest to you that ignoring problems don't make it any better. That didn't work at Corinth. You see, they had a fornicator in the midst. And I know this is church problem, not a marriage problem. It was a marriage problem. But what the text is addressing is not the marriage problem, but the church problem. But the principle is still the same. They were ignoring the fact there was a fornicator in their midst. They should have dealt with it. They had not even mourned about the problem. And it had not helped the problem. It had made the problem worse. It wasn't until they backed up and addressed the problem that things got better. It didn't work at Corinth. It's altogether possible I could deceive myself. The Bible warns abundantly about deceiving myself. This is about obeying the word, James 1 and verse 22. I could begin to think that because I'm a hearer of the word, I'm a doer of the word, and I have convinced myself something that is not true. Maybe I could deceive myself into thinking, you know, my marriage is okay. Our our strain is not all that bad. Our difficulty is not all that dangerous, and so we just ignore that, and so maybe, maybe, just maybe everything will be okay. In the Old Testament times, there were false prophets who cried peace when there is no peace. Jeremiah 8 in verse 11, 6 in verse 14. As Jeremiah was saying, there's problems in the nation, and there are prophets saying, oh, no, no, there's not problems. Peace, peace. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. This is normal. This is okay. And maybe you're telling yourself, everything's okay. This is normal, this marriage problem. Everybody else is facing the same thing. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. When we allow problems to grow, 
and we ignore them, they just get worse and they get worse. How so? Look at chapter 8 and verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the Son of Man is fully set on them to do evil. Now that applies in a number of realms. It may be a nation doesn't deal with crime, and so they let it go on. It just gets worse and worse. Maybe children that misbehave, we just allow that to go on, it just gets worse and worse. Maybe someone's sinning in the church and they continue on and nothing is done, like 1 Corinthians 5, it just gets worse and worse. The marriage problem is ignored, it just gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And so one of the warning signs is when we ignore the problem. Here's another warning sign that may begin to flash and say, you know what, we've got some troubles. And that is when the kids know, the children know there is a problem. It's possible to have problems in a marriage, major problems, devastating problems, and the kids don't have a clue. That's possible. So that's not always a gauge that the kids don't know, so we must not have problems. But what I'm suggesting to you is when the children start noticing the problem has risen to a different level that cannot be hidden anymore. See, when the children know Daddy is mad at mama. And this isn't the first time. He was mad at her last week. In fact, just a day or two ago, he was mad at her. And they're taking note of that. And when the children know when mama is giving daddy a cold shoulder, they may notice that when, when daddy tries to talk to her, she ignores him. They've taken notice of that. Or maybe they know when the parents are ignoring each other. I notice that they, they're not talking to each other. They talk to us as the kids, but they're not talking to each other. Something's going on with mom and daddy. They know some of the arguments that were supposed to be private. That should have been kept private, but they heard some of that arguing. And they know what it was about. That may indicate there's some real problems. They know when mama didn't come home one night. And they know when daddy didn't show up. And they know when they sleep in separate bedrooms because they're not getting along. Children take notice of that. The problems have risen to a different level. The results? Children are discouraged. Let's go to Colossians 3 and verse 21. In the rearing and the raising of our children, we should conduct ourselves in such a way that our children do not become discouraged. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't deal with your children in a way that they become discouraged. There's a number of ways in which that may happen. In other words, you may give rules that, are, that, that they cannot meet. You, you give them expectations they cannot meet, and so that discourages them. Maybe you only give criticism and never praise. That discourages them. But I'll tell you something else that discourages your children is when they know there's problems at home and they hear mom and daddy arguing and they hear the fussing and they know there's some differences and they see all those problems. They know there's a problem. That's discouraging. The children are taught that dysfunctional is normal. They think every family is like this. This is the way it's supposed to be. Every family church must be those where mom and dad don't get along and they fuss and they argue and they uh, don't come home some nights. They sleep in separate bedrooms. That happens to everybody's family. They are taught that dysfunctional is normal. Are your children beginning to notice? Have your children overheard some arguing? Have the children noticed that there is this friction between the husband and the wife? If the children are noticing, you mark it down. Others are noticing too. Your marriage may be in trouble. Another warning sign that your marriage may be in trouble is when there is more talk about divorce than there is marriage. When there's more talk about divorce than there is marriage. In your relationship, do you, do you mention divorce more? The possibility of divorce? We may just have to end in divorce. Or is this going to end in divorce? How far is this going to go? Are you going to divorce me? We may be talking more about divorce than we talk about we're a married couple and we, we need to keep this marriage together. The Bible teaches that marriage is permanent and divorce is forbidden. Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 4, you might be turning there, and 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 13, 
make it abundantly clear that the Lord's teaching is that marriage is permanent and divorce is forbidden. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. At least four times in that text, the Lord emphasizes you can't get a divorce, you can't get a divorce, you can't get a divorce, you can't get a divorce. Let's see what Jesus said. Beginning at verse 3, the Pharisees came to him, testing him, and they said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, some of the commentators will say, Jesus ignored the question. I beg to differ. He did not ignore the question. He hit it right in the middle. By not only answering the question, he gave four reasons for his answer to the question. And here was his answer, beginning at verse 4. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? See that at verse 4? In other words, God made one man for one woman for life. The answer to the question is, no, you can't divorce just for any reason. Let's go to verse 5. Are you reading verse 5? For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined or cleave, the King James says, to his wife. That's a word for glue, from which we get our word glue. It means to be glued together. A man must cleave to his mate. So his answer then, if you must cleave to your mate, be glued to your mate, the answer is no. You can't get a divorce just for any reason. We're not through. Let's read further at verse 5. And the two shall become one flesh. Verse 6 says there are no longer two, but one flesh. One is the only number. As far as people are concerned, you cannot divide so thirdly, Jesus said they are one flesh, so the answer to the question is no. And then at verse 6, he said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So the question, verse 3, was can a man divorce his wife just for any reason? And the answer is no, 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 and no. What reason for that, Jesus? One man for one woman must cleave to your mate. You're one flesh and God has joined you together. There's the four reasons. The answer is no, 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 and no. Marriage is permanent. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 10, and see if there's any different answer to that. Paul is addressing the question, beginning at verse 10, concerning marriage and the permanence of marriage. And he said, to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. By the way, that word depart is translated divorce in the very next verse. It's translated put asunder in Matthew chapter uh, 19, in verse 6. It leads to a ending of the marriage, leaves them in an unmarried state in verse 11, so it must have reference to divorce. So now let's go back to verse 10. A wife is not to depart or divorce her husband. So is marriage permanent? She's not to divorce. Let's go now to verse 11. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. To divorce her? No, he's not to divorce her. Now let's drop down to verse 12. And to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if her brother has a wife and does not be, who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Verse 13, a woman which hath a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And so four times, as we did in Matthew 19, don't depart, that means divorce, don't divorce, don't divorce, don't divorce. So eight times in the New Testament, don't get a divorce, 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 don't get a divorce. Sounds pretty permanent, doesn't it? Now in your marriage relationship, quite often when, when there's problems arise, even New Testament Christians will talk about divorce more than they talk about trying to keep the marriage together. And so they talk that as if that's the solution to a miserable home. In other words, we're not getting along, we're fussing and fighting, we're, we're friction, so maybe, just maybe, maybe we just ought to end this in divorce. Quite often, divorce is used as a threat to get what you want. If you don't do what I'm wanting, if you don't make some changes, I'm going to divorce you. Whether they have a right or not, I'm going to divorce you. They may not mean that, but they use it sometimes as a threat. We often forget that God hates divorce, Malachi 2 and in verse 16. Divorce just creates more problems. How so? For your spiritual condition. If there is no justifiable cause, you've created a spiritual problem, both for you and maybe your mate. Matthew 5, 32. You've created more problems for your children, and now there's a question of whether you have a right to remarry, depending on the cause for which you, you put your mate away. It creates more problems than it solves. We ought to be looking for grounds for marriage and not grounds for divorce. 
rather than looking at your marriage and say, do we have grounds to end this? Do we have grounds to keep this to marriage? Can I keep it together? What can we do and how can we keep it together? How can we salvage our souls? How can we work through our problems? What kind of common bond do we have that we can build upon? What kind of common ground do we have that we can solve our issues and our differences? We ought to be looking for grounds for marriage and not grounds for divorce. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. The text says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives. There's a command. Titus 2 Wives are taught by the older women to love their husbands. That also is a command. What do I learn from that? You can learn to love your mate again. If the friction has developed to the point that, that you're pulling apart and you say, you know what, we don't love each other anymore. I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. Mar the love is gone. Well, if you want to follow the will of God, if God commands you to love, you can learn to love them again. You learn to love them the first time. You can learn to love them again. And that's because we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Philippians 4.13 is not an all-encompassing positive mental attitude, but it is saying I can do anything God expects of me. I can obey any command. I can endure any trial. I can bear through any problem if God expects me to. So if God expects me to love my wife, I can learn to love her again. If God expects me to love my husband, then I can learn to love him again, just like God commands us to. And finally, a warning sign your marriage may be in trouble when there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of fussing in the marriage relationship. When there's a lot of anger, continual anger indicates some deeper problems. Let's go to Proverbs 15 and in verse 1. Proverbs 15 and in verse 1 a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. You see, when, when the husband and wife are passing harsh words toward each other, that indicates, that anger indicates there's deeper problems than just the anger. That anger is reflecting some deeper problems going on. In fact, Colossians chapter 3 Colossians 3 and in verse 8 says, this is sinful behavior. That is, this outburst of anger, this outburst of wrath is sinful behavior that needs to be put off, needs to be thrown away. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. That means you can put this off. You can bring it to an end. You can throw it away. What, do I, what am I to throw away? Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth. May not be easy. That may be difficult to turn loose and let it go, but anger can be thrown away, can be cast off. Sinful behavior. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, same context. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter. It's hatred. Don't be bitter toward it. You can, bitterness toward a mate can be cast aside. That continual an anger indicates deeper problems. Constant fussing and arguing indeed is a real problem. Why? Because it's contrary to the principle of love. We've already looked at Titus 2 and Ephesians 5. Husbands love your wives. Wives are to love their husbands. That's contrary to the principle of love. You don't argue and fuss with one that you love. It's not honorable, but in fact it's foolish. Let's go back to Proverbs 20 and in verse 3. I say back to Proverbs. We've been there tonight, but we've also recently studied Proverbs. It is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. See, it doesn't take a lot of skill as a husband to argue and fuss at your wife. It doesn't take a lot of skill as a wife to argue and fuss with your husband. Because any fool can do that. But it takes some wisdom to be able to rein that in when maybe your mate is raising their voice for you to be calm, like Proverbs 15 and verse 1 would suggest. We're not trying to calmly communicate when we're fussing and when we're arguing. So if there's anger and arguing that's a regular thing in your marriage relationship, then your marriage may be in trouble. Their marriage may be indeed in trouble. Are there warning signs going off? Like on the dash of your car, it says, you know what, you need to stop and, and have some, some work done, some service done before it gets too late, before it's all ruined. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is a suggestive list that if there are some of these problems going on in your marriage relationship, your marriage may be in trouble if one or both of you are beginning to drift from the Lord. Or when there's a greater interest outside the home than it is within. Or maybe you both are telling 
other people, their mate is the problem. Or maybe you're ignoring your problems, thinking they'll go away. The kids are finding out there's friction. There's more talk of divorce than marriage, or there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of fussing. Your marriage may indeed be in trouble. Stop and deal with that before it's everlasting too late. There may be one or more present this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come tonight believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?